Loma Linda, 10.50 a.m., 106.5 FM, and now 102.3 FM. Welcome to The Mortgage Voice with Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. Each week on this program, Jeff and his guests share their expertise, personal anecdotes, and the latest industry news to keep you in the loop. Now to provide you with insight and help you navigate the consistently changing world of real estate lending, here is your host for The Mortgage Voice, Jeff Barton. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeff Barton. This is The Mortgage Voice, and you are tuned in to many of our stations. We're across a lot of the southeast in, in California, certainly out to Las Vegas, Nevada, five stations, three different states. If you want to hear us, you can go to any one of these things. We're in KCAA, KMET in Southern California, kind of our home base. We're also out at uh, K-Mine Country in Albuquerque, New Mexico, as well as K-Ship in Las Vegas, Nevada, and up in K-Tahoe in Lake Tahoe, and that's in Central California. Uh, we bring these interesting times to you and i don't know whether they're interesting to you but they are to us why because things have a changed if you're looking back even three months ago you would see rates have risen about three percentage points meaning that you could have got a rate could have got a rate in the twos at that time now you're in the mid fives that's right five percent now that's still incredibly low historically so don't get freaked but if you were on the margins at that time Prices have also risen probably 4 or 5% since then. So not only are the houses really expensive, but so is the mortgage. So for those people, I'm, I'm sorry. I wish I could help you. And I can't even help you on the, the, the rental front because in all of these places that we are broadcasting, rents are more expensive than mortgages. I'll say that again. In most of the places in the country, as well as specifically these five areas three stations in five different uh, five stations in three different states that I mentioned the rents that you're going to pay are more expensive than the mortgage you could pay now that's an amazing amazing statistic it's not a good statistic but it's an amazing statistic now I've got three kids in college we're not in college I, I, I keep saying that my last one graduated I went to Boston over the weekend she graduated from a school. And by the way, if you have kids in school and they don't have a means to pay back that loan with the promise of either a job or a career or a skill that they can readily turn into money on a monthly basis, forget Joe Biden relieving that money. That's not going to happen. That's $1.5 trillion in school loans debt. That's an insane number. When you consider mortgages last year, we did four and a half trillion dollars. This year we're slated to do about 2.7. That's 1.5 or 1.7 trillion dollars. That's the amount, and you can, the, the numbers are so astounding. But so if you're not in that group that got out of college with a degree that says I can walk into a job and make X amount of dollars, oh boy. Anyway. My daughter got out of school, pleased to say. My sons are out of school, too. Now, they live in, in very expensive places. Two of them live in New York City, in Brooklyn. One lives in Seattle, Washington, up in the Northwest. All of these places are expensive, but they all have jobs. Now, do they have the job they want? Do they have the ideal career they're trying to get? No, I don't think so. But they are able to support themselves, and that really, coming out of college, is a great thing. But my kids had an advantage over a lot of other kids, and we're going to talk about that with my first guest when she comes on the show. The advantages that we have not only monetarily, but also because who we are and what we look like. The advantages in the marketplace are astounding. The advantages to get loans are amazing. We've talked and really looked at that problem on the show many, many times uh, on how certain groups are advantaged, certain groups are disadvantaged, and there's nothing you can do about it. And so in bringing on our first guest today, she's going to talk about a book she wrote and, and some of the things that we try to build into our education through however you do it. And now a lot of people get educated or ed edumacated on uh, Facebook. They try to blend with the people that think the way they think. I try to do the opposite. I try to attract people 
who think completely the opposite of the way I think. Because without challenging your particular beliefs about whatever it is that you think, you are never going to really analyze something in a, in a way that's going to benefit you, the people around you, your family, society as a, rule, as a whole. Now, in the mortgage business, we do this all the time. We have programs. Now, in this changing environment, we're going to have a couple of great guests on today talk about what's happening with their lenders and what are the programs they're using to attract borrowers. Now, all lenders are in trouble right now. Why? Because volume is down. Obviously, if you're going to drop $1.7 trillion in loan originations in 2022, well, yeah, you are going to have some problems with some of these lenders staying in business or out of business. And as a quick aside, United Wholesale Mortgage, the largest wholesale mortgage non-institutional lender, and Rocket Mortgage, the second biggest non-institutional lender, both had billion-dollar first quarters of 2022. Now, is that a holdover? Because we know refis are down 33%. We do know that purchases are up 14%, but that doesn't offset. We know that the huge dollar amount that is out of the system will not be originated this year isn't coming back. So how do these companies have these kind of quarters? Most lenders are laying people off, underwriters, um, set up people, People in the field, account executives, funders, they're laying off because the volume isn't there. Anyway, I want to talk to these two people that come on the show today, two account executives, two different lenders, about what kind of programs they're offering and what kind of scramble there is to keep loans coming in the door. Now, we already know margins are cut. We, we During the pandemic, when, you know, make, make hay while the sun shines, well, that's what the mortgage broker community did. That's what the mortgage lenders did. That's what banks did in mortgage lending. It was, you know, as Warren Buffett said and continues to say, he says, when it's raining gold, put out a bucket. And that's what everybody in our business did. We made a ton of dough, and now we're in tougher times. So the margins during the pandemic, maybe 3.5%. Well, now they're down to 1.5%. And if you figure in costs and commissions and whatever else expenses, you're running pretty thin, probably closer to a thousand bucks a loan. That's what you're making. And that's not a lot if you have a huge overhead. So watching large companies like Rocket and UW and make money is kind of, uh, I don't know how they do it. We'll see what happens during the second quarter, during the third quarter. When it really settles in to the marketplace, these rates today will not be the rates next week next month, next quarter, they're going to go up. We're going to see 6 6.5% by the end of the year probably, right? Now, I'm not in the prediction business, but I'm just saying if in four months it's raised three points, we're probably going to see it raise at least a point for the rest of the year. It only goes to make logical sense to be able to do that. When you're deciding what to do and how to do, you need somebody that can solve problems for you. Those problems in our business are, what kind of loan can we get this person? Is it a conventional 30-year fix with a 750 FICO score? Or is it someone who works for themselves who is writing things off on his business but is using his business bank deposits to qualify for the loan? Now, when I'm quoting five, well, let's get to it for a second. Okay, the 30-year fix rate is at 5.4%. The uh, 15 years at 4.78, FHA is at 5.12, Jumbo is at 4.60, and the 5.1 arm is at 4.57. When you look at these rates and what they are, these are for the best borrowers. If you're somebody who's in the non-QM space, which was the second loan I talked about, guy who runs a business, gal who, who opened up uh, a business and is running on business bank statements in order to qualify for a loan for her mortgage or their mortgage, that program's not at 5.4%. That program's at 7% because that's the way non-QM skyrocketed in terms of, of, of rates over the past 30 days, 45 days. Anyway, we've got a lot of solutions for you. But the main thing here is to try to stay calm, look to see if uh, housing, in terms of the 
number of houses on the market is improving in terms of the total number of houses are improving. We've got a chart here somewhere that talks about some of the major cities and, and where they're heading in the listings. It looks bleak. There are some other things that look bleak, too. The economy, maybe. Inflation, absolutely. Gas prices, anybody bought a six and a half dollars worth of gas? I have. It was unbelievable. 118, that's what it cost me to fill my car. I was like, wow, it's unbelievable. Anyway, I'm Jeff Martin. I'm your voice in the mortgage industry. Let's get into some of this and more, and we'll be right back. You're listening to The Mortgage Voice with Jeff Barton. We'll be right back with more in just a moment. For more information on today's topic, email Jeff Barton at info at malibufunding.net. Now, back to The Mortgage Voice with your host, Jeff Barton. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. Thanks very much for tuning into the show. Each and every week, we bring terrific guests to the show. Uh, we try to broaden the horizon of people who are out there listening, trying to find solutions to problems in the lending. Now, we talk about uh, favoritism, racism, all kinds of things on the show that affect borrowers. Borrowers out there, all they want to do is get a loan, get a house. They, they don't want all the, all the Michigas and everything else going on to prevent them from doing that. But uh, that's just not the way it is. And fighting that and trying to Combat that is uh, what we've been doing at uh, the company I work for, Malibu Funding, who sponsors the show for years. Anyway, I brought uh, a person who's written a book, The Colorful Image of God, uh, concerning some of these topics, and I bring her on now, Catherine Martin. Catherine, how are you? Hey, Jeff. I'm great. Good to be here. Thank you very much, and thanks for coming on to the show. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. I'd I love to get a chance to talk about this important topic, so I'm grateful. You know, um... I, I, I don't know if you're aware. I guess everybody's aware at, at some point that in the lending business, you know, people lend uh, primarily to communities that they think can pay back the loan easily, right? But unfortunately yep. for us, that means a certain look of a person. Yeah. Combating the, 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 the thought that that's a safer loan is, is m maddening. Your book deals with it in different ways. Tell me something about the book and, and something about how you're helping to try to bring this awareness to people. Yeah, so, I mean, you're right in your industry, right? We see this a lot, I think, historically going all the way back to redlining, probably before that. That's not necessarily my industry's expertise. But in general, I think we can look at any system, any, any business in, in our country, in particular, and see elements of racism. So my background is, Largely education. I've been working in the education space for about 15 years, and um, honestly, about 15 years ago, my eyes were really open to um, it, the injustice of our public education system. Some kids, you know, that are uh, middle, upper class, getting great public school education, and those kids normally are white. Um, and then other kids growing up in poverty, oftentimes black and brown children, not getting as good education. So. Um, that was the problem that I was seeking to solve with, with other people. But as I got into it, Jeff, I think just realizing, gosh, like, this is this goes really, really deep. And so the book that I wrote about was sort of my personal experience awakening to race and racism in this country, what it means to be white, white privilege, um, somewhat around the education system, but honestly more broadly. And I've just been on this journey to become a better human, you know, looking at things like implicit bias, um, stereotypes and things like that. So that's the, the, the basis of the book. You know, the, the book itself comes across as you personally, which is always a great way that I like to read something rather than a very cold technical manual on a how-to. This is, as you said, your personal experience, which comes through loudly in the book, as well as specific examples of what you went through and how it is, I guess, expressed to a, a larger audience. Is that what you intended to do when you wrote the book? Yeah. Um, thanks for saying that. I, I really wrote it as a gift to largely other white people, um, specifically white people of the Christian faith. That's my lens. But I think right. any white person could really benefit from it. But, um, yeah, I felt like I was given such, such a gift of feedback, honestly, from some um, colleagues of color many, many years ago who said, listen, our experiences – are not the same as those of our white counterparts. And with me being a leader on that team, that hit hard. And I thought, oh, my gosh, what do you mean? Like, I think I'm a good person. I think I love right. people well. I think I'm a good manager. But 
as I began to sort of listen to their stories and their experiences of everyday racism that happens, you know, everywhere, right, in organizations, at the grocery store, wherever, I realized that this, this was an area that I just didn't know a lot about. And so I honestly went back to thinking about childhood, how I was raised, and I think we all receive messages from different places, family, media, et cetera, and really had to sort of interrogate um, what I believed about people and, and just trying to live better. I mean, I would never say that I, that I think differently of people because of the color of their skin tone, but when you really begin to understand whiteness um, and racism, you realize that we all are involved and are guilty in some ways. Um, and, it, and the book certainly is not about trying to make feel, people feel bad, but just really um, – sort of bringing awareness to the issue to figure out what is our own small part that we can all play in uprooting this challenge. Now, it, it being a challenge, is this one of the reasons that you brought a Christian perspective to the book to try to help people understand that either through whatever mechanism they use, the example that you always bring in is something from the Bible. Is that a way by which you can soften the message, or is this just something by which you think, no, this is who we are as this, so you can't do this because that would be hypocritical? Yeah. Yeah, so because I see the, the world through that Christian lens and believe in God, to me, as I started learning about racism— I felt this real um, dissonance between what I what I truly believe, which is, you know, imago dei, all people, right. all people are made in the image of God, all people have inherent worth and dignity, and there was a real dissonance between what I believe and then how people were telling me their lived experiences were, um, you know, under my leadership and, um, and just in general. And so I think, to me, the, the way I wrote the book um, and trying to bring in scripture, and I think how Jesus lived is to point out to Christians in particular, if we're trying to live the life of Jesus, somewhere, someone that got proximate um, to the marginalized and the poor and loved people really, really well, there's a lot of areas um, as the sort of broad church that we're not doing that super well. You know, I think a lot of times white people, especially in the church I'm finding, can get defensive yep. and sort of uh, get really nervous talking about race and say, oh, not me. And I think if we're truly walking in the ways of Jesus, we would be much more humble and sort of take a breath and recognize that racism is just like any other sin area. And if we want to, you know, live better lives, we've got to kind of unpack this and understand that race really does affect every system of our country. So that was my connection to um, the Christian worldview. I will say, you know, some of my friends that are not Christians who are identified as white that have read the book feel like, you know what, for me— I just replace God with the universe or, you know, whatever their right. understanding of a higher power is in some cases. Mm-hmm. And the, the core messages of sort of understanding self and understanding systems of injustice, I think, still really re- are resonating with people, which is great. How do you feel about people calling you super woke? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, listen, what we don't want to do, especially as white people, is get into the woke wars, right? right. I mean, I think right. <laughs> Quite progressive, which I would consider myself one, yep. can be some of the worst at this, sort of trying to one-up each other. And yep. like, we don't want to do that. Then we're just as guilty, right? And so I think this is really about, listen, like, if, if being woke means, you know, literally being awakened to um, issues of race and injustice, then, yeah, I'd like to think I'm woke. But I not in a uh, status way, or I think that we've got to be really careful about making other people feel bad. Like, if you don't know about this stuff, you don't know about it. And so I think, how can we bring people into the conversation? Um, that's why I try to tell a lot of personal, really vulnerable right. stories of places where I've gotten this wrong, because if the end goal is that we all, you know, live better lives, right, love our neighbors better, um, help figure out some of these injustices in the system, like, we don't need people, you know, feeling bad or feeling like they don't have a place at the table to, to learn. So... I think that um, I think for me it's all about learning, and honestly, like we're, we're never going to be, in my opinion, woke enough. We want to use that phrase. I think it's all about learning and that journey. Honestly, who is the book directed to? Yeah, I mean, the book is directed to white Christians. I think that people that say that they love God and love their neighbor and identify as white in general have a lot of learning to do in this area. I don't think especially because many churches in America are segregated. I don't think broadly, this is getting better, but I don't think a lot, broadly speaking, a lot of white churches are tackling racism. And 
and honestly, understanding the church's role in it. I mean, the reason that a lot of black churches were started in this country is because they weren't invited to the white churches, right? Like segregation. And so I think we've got to sort of bring a stance of humility um, and get better. So I think that is my target audience. Um, and then, like I said, I think that white people that, that are not necessarily people of, of any faith or of other faith are, are finding some points in it. And I'll be honest, Jeff, I've heard recently some, some of my friends of color that they have enjoyed the book because they care about this topic and they care about making the world a better place. And they're right. people that just like reading different people's perspectives. So that's kind of been cool too, but that's, they are not my target audience. You know, they're sort of living, yep. living under this racism world every day. Listen, we have run out of time. I want to have you back, but could you let people know one, how they can get the book and two, how they might be able to contact you? Yeah, I'd love to. The easiest place is my website. It's Catherine Learns, so K-A-T-H-E-R-I-N-E-L-E-A-R-N-S dot com. I blog on that site, and there's also a page about my book where you can order it directly from any of the major online real, uh, retailers, um, and you can certainly email me, uh, follow along to my newsletter and things like that via the website. So KatherineLearns.com is the best place, and the book, again, is called The Colorful Image of God. You can find it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble online, et cetera. Catherine Martin, hey, thanks very much for coming on the show. That was terrific. I appreciate it very much, and let's do it again. Thanks for the opportunity. I love it. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Catherine. And I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. We'll be right back. You're listening to The Mortgage Voice with Jeff Barton. We'll be right back with more in just a moment. For more information on today's topic, email Jeff Barton at info at malibufunding.net. Now, back to The Mortgage Voice with your host, Jeff Barton. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Jeff Barton, your host here for The Mortgage Voice, and we're on every week. We are on a number of different radio stations as well as podcasts. Uh, you, you know what? You can also see us, hear us, mortgagevoice.com. Uh, that's our website. If you go there, you can see the topics of what we're talking about every show. You can visit with the guests. You can call them up or email them if they have their contact information down there. The mortgagevoice.com talks about what we do on the show, and it is perfect. So go there and that's that's the bell that says i gotta go anyway um with us uh today to talk a little bit about what's happening in the mortgage industry and what's happening over at deep haven is um justin hardman and i appreciate it justin how are you how are you how are you doing well jeff how are you i'm fine thank you i know you're busy dad so we'll let's get right to it product what's happening with product especially in the current rate environment yeah, yeah, absolutely. So obviously, as, as everybody knows right now, rates are just going crazy. Nobody really knows what to expect from a day to day basis. Right. Uh, you know, here at Deep Haven, we've 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 stayed relatively consistent in, in our product offerings. Um, like everybody else, obviously, our rates have adjusted, uh, kind of with the market as the market demands. Uh, but as far as the product line, uh, pretty much the same thing that we've always done. Okay. Um, you're, Big things are your bank statement loans, uh, DSTR loans will go down to 0.75, loan amounts up to $3 million, uh, uh, that kind of stuff. Okay, okay. And in that product mix, are you seeing that uh, more people are coming to non-QM now because of the rates rising, because of the difficulty of perhaps um, a, a changing circumstance with a conventional loan? Or do you see the volume steady? Yeah, no, it's, it's on a good day, it's steady. Uh, uh, on a better day, it's, it's even uh, a, a much more increased than it has been. And the big reason for that is is the refi market at this point, for the most part, is dead. Yep. Um, so, you know, you don't have the cookie-cutter refinances coming in. So what you find is a lot of loan officers right now have to have to kind of reassess their business model of what they've been doing, right. honestly, for the past you know, 10, 15 years. And they have to fill in that refinance gap that they just simply, you know, don't have anymore. You know, so what we've noticed is a lot of people uh, that never did non-QM before are kind of coming over to the non-QM side of things because they need to fill in, you know, the refinance gap. T tell us a little bit about how Deep Haven is competing with, obviously, if, if uh, loan officers are doing it, um, a lot of the lenders are opening up non-QM that haven't done it before. Now, Deep Haven's been in the, in the space for a while. How are you competing with the fact that the newcomers are trying to come in to this space? Uh, Non-QM is a different kind of animal when it comes to underwriting. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So one thing I do want to point out, yes, you are correct, especially with, you know, the refinance market drying up. Um, a lot of lenders are kind of trying to come into the space, kind of dip their toes in, see if right. it's something that they want to do. 
Deep Haven, we've been doing it. Only non-QM, no Fannie, no Freddie, no FHA, VA, anything like that. We've been doing only non-QM since we launched. Right. So a big difference that you'll see with Deep Haven is we have non-QM underwriters underwriting non-QM. Right. Our account managers are non-QM account managers. Same with our account executives. So what you don't have with Deep Haven is conventional underwriters trying to underwrite a non-QM file, which is very, very different. Right. And in fact, first thing. So, yeah, you got a lot of companies out there that are trying to, you know, launch their own, non, you know, suite of non-QM products. We've been doing it the longest, and it's all we do. No, I, I think that's really important. When you're talking about getting into a purchase and you want to do non-QM and you want to have a lock of 30 days, let's say, you want to make sure that that thing closes on time because if rates rise and they blow that lock, they may have to come in with a lot more money to close. Correct. Yeah. So as, as far as our closing times are concerned, we, we pretty much stayed the same, 30 days or less. Ideas. We actually just launched a DSCR 15 days or less program, whereas if you come in with a DSCR loan and you have the, the required set of documentation, we will close that loan in 15 days. Okay, uh, let's get right to that. Tell me, what are the documentation or what is, what? I don't even know whether it's plural or singular, but the documents needed for a DSCR. And the DSCR, of course, is a, uh, you're buying a rental property, basically, and you want to make sure that whatever you're taking in rent is going to, afford the mortgage and that's how you qualify what are the documents you need to bring to start that process or to you know get it done yeah so i mean it's your it's your pretty standard documentation for for uh you know you're you're, you're either non qm or fanny freddie loan the difference is we don't collect any sort of income documentation outside of you know the property has obviously the property so from a documentation standpoint, it's, it's the same standard documentation minus your W-2s, bank statements for income, stuff like that. So when we say we what documentation we want up front on the DSCR for the 15 days or less, that is your asset statements as of a purchase or a rate and term refinance, driver's license, social security card if applicable, and essentially just a, obviously the purchase contract and a, uh, I forget exactly what it's called, but basically like a, a Zillow or a realtor opinion of the right. value of your primary rent. Yeah, we well, have that stuff. We will get that loan closed in 15 days or less, assuming you know the appraisal doesn't take too long, stuff like that. Okay, that's a good point. You bring up appraisals. Uh, appraisals usually come in with either a rent roll or something that the uh, the, the unit itself will rent for. Um, that being ordered by either the loan officer or through Deep Haven. Are you have you been having trouble getting uh, appraisals done on time? No, not really. Okay. Uh, most most areas in the country, uh, not not really an issue. There's the occasional, you know, uh, <laughs> obviously if we're doing a you know a loan in Wyoming or something yeah. like that, obviously yeah. that's going to take a little bit longer. But uh, I mean, we have three great AMCs that we work with that we have great relationships with. Um, so really, haven't really had much of an issue with it. Okay, so if we're talking hmm, cost rates, things like that. Uh, if I was to say, all right, I, I want to come in and um, uh, get a DSCR right now, I want to know if I should wait. Uh, or do you think rates are going down? How often do the rates rise? Where do you think the rate market is headed in the non-QM space, especially for this type of loan? So after the after the rate pandemonium here about a month <laughs> and a half, two months ago, yep. I was just uh, yep. you know, anybody what was going to happen day to day. Uh, we've seen rates obviously, you know, continuously rise. We probably, on average, I would say over the last say two months, maybe seen one, maybe two rate adjustments a, a week. And generally, they're minimal, you know, an eight yep. quarter something like that. So it's not a huge, huge difference. Uh, as far as your question about should you wait, no, you should not wait. Uh, right. Rates, I think everybody knows they're not going down. The Fed is going to continue to meet. So I'm not a gambler. Uh, I don't advise my, my, you know, my loan officers, my brokers, my consumers to gamble on, on interest mm -hmm. rates either, especially when the Fed has told us exactly what they're going to do. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, uh, given the fact that the 10-year is what it is and it keeps rising because they want to have people buy U.S. debt, um, yeah, there's volatility because of the Fed raising their own particular rates, half point, and they're going to do it again a half point in about six weeks. Uh, yeah, Correct. I think locking is the way to go. But I know also that non-QM doesn't price the way uh, conventional markets. Like if a 30-year comes out with pricing maybe a couple times a day, 
Uh, it's not as often, but it's a little steeper in the non-QM space. Is that right? Uh, in some cer in some uh, circumstances, yes. In some circumstances, no. You're exactly right. That we we generally don't have two, three, four rate changes per day. Right. Uh, again, it's you know w once or twice a week, if at all. Uh, as far as steeper, I, I won't necessarily say that it's steeper. Um, I, I feel like it can maybe look a little bit steeper because our interest rates are you know naturally a little bit higher. Right. Of course. You know, based on the, due, due to the program, right? Right. Um, but no, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that it's, it's steeper or more severe each time we do have a rate adjustment. But yeah, you know, we just kind of follow follow what the bond does. Now, are you seeing more purchase? Obviously, the refi business is dead. But are you seeing more purchase per se uh, than you were seeing prior to, I guess, all these rate hikes uh, in January? Uh, yeah, I would, I would say so. Right. Uh, it hasn't been such a stark increase as. as uh, you know, conventional uh, runoffs or broker would see. I mean, that's revise are for the most part non existent. We do get a lot more unique circumstances why people need to refinance. I see. And it's not always it's not always just rate reduction like it typically is for a, a conventional or FHA call. So. Right. Okay. Hey listen, uh, Justin, could you shout out or let people know how they can get in touch with you on some of these great products and certainly to talk to you about a non QM, QM space? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, again, my name is Justin Hardman. I work with Deep Haven Mortgage. My direct phone number, this is my cell phone, 704-661-2699. And you can also reach me at my email address, uh, jhardman at deephavenmortgage.com. That's J-H-A-R-D as in David, M-A-N, at deephavenmortgage.com. Justin, thanks very much. Appreciate the updates. We'll get back to you, especially with the volatility going on in the market. We always want to keep uh, updated, especially uh, with you know what you're doing over at Deep Haven. Thanks for coming on. Thanks so much, Jeff. Take Thank care. you very much. I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. We'll be right back. You're listening to The Mortgage Voice with Jeff Barton. We'll be right back with more in just a moment. For more information on today's topic, email Jeff Barton at info at malibufunding.net. Now, back to The Mortgage Voice with your host, Jeff Barton. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. Thanks very much for tuning into the show each and every week. If you want to see the show, you can go to two places. You can go to themortgagevoice.com where you can hear the show. You can go to YouTube where you can see and hear the show. Jeff Barton, the mortgage voice is on YouTube and themortgagevoice.com is our website. Both you can join, listen to, get updates. Make sure you click on that little bell or button or whatever it is just because more people see it. More information gets out there, and mortgage information right now is at a premium. It's not all doom and gloom all the time, but there are things you need to be aware of, and there are programs out there that you might not know about. Uh, in that vein, we bring back to the show Tomas Trujillo. He is a account executive from AT, AT Lending, and uh, he joins us now. Tomas, how are you? I'm great, Jeff. How are you today? You know, I'm okay. Thank you very much. It's been such a volatile time um, the news is never good. I can't even watch it anymore. And, of course, you know, in the midst of all of this, my wife breaks her ankle, so I've been home nursing her for quite some time. So it's a little a little crazy around my house. How about yourself? <laughs> <laughs> it's a little, a little crazy, a little crazy. Uh, I've had a little bit of knee problems, so I'm dealing with that. But what gets me more is how everybody is freaking out about what's going on. Yep. And this is no big deal. Right. You and I have been doing this for so long. I bet you remember when B of A had a prime rate of 21% <laughs> and people loved it. <laughs> you know, it's funny that we talk like this, but there is a new group of people who have not experienced. They, there's a whole group of borrowers that haven't even experienced 2008 when we had the, um, uh, the mortgage meltdown at that time. Uh, since that time, it has really been gravy. Rates have been continually falling for 10 years. And it's, you know, finally uh, time that rates go up. And like you say, hey, 5.5% is still a pretty good rate. It's a great rate. Back right. in 07, when we were, when we were doing 80-20s, you had a 6.99 first and a 12% second. <laughs> we have great rates right now. Are you kidding me? Right. No, I agree with you. Okay. Tell us about AT Lending. What do you do? How do you do it? And how long have you been in the business? All that kind of great stuff. AT Lending is relatively new. They've been around for about two years. 
luckily for me, everybody that's running the place has been around as long as I have. So we're talking about 20, 30 years. Okay. We do A paper. We'll do government loans. As well as 580 FICOs, we do non-QM, VOE-only loans, bank statement loans. We do doctor loans. <clears throat> we do a little bit of everything, and we do it right, and we do it quick. What's what's the major selling point for your particular company? Is it service? Is it underwriting? Is it quick turn times? Is it um, manual underwriting? What, what What is it that you guys do? It is all of the above. We, we do manual underwriting if needed. Uh-huh. Uh huh. We'll, we'll we'll go by the DU. We, we'll go by the LP. No overlays on that. Good. On DSCR loans, we'll go up to eighty percent with a debt service coverage of below one percent. We'll go down to seventy-five, maybe even sixty-five. We want to make deals work. We're not stuck. We're not a big corporation. We don't follow anybody's rules. We we have our own money. We have our own program. If we like it, we're going to do it. You know, during these kind of times, you see a lot of lenders going out of business. For you guys to come into business right now, uh, over the last two years, and to try to knock it out of the park, you have to have strong financial backing. Tell us a little bit about that. The owner of the company is a big car guy. He owns multiple dealerships. Okay. So he's, he's got money. He has a relationship with banks. Okay. His relationship has come from... Obviously, his car lender, he's been doing that for 40 years. Right. So that's what facilitated going into lending because his bank was saying, hey, we can do this, we can do that. You know how to put deals together. Get a team, and we'll back you. And that's what happened. That, well, that's kind of exciting, right? I mean, I know a lot of businesses, mine in particular, uh, started during a recession, started during times were not great. Uh, now, if, if you look overall at the economy, uh, employment, uh, it, it's pretty good from that standpoint. If you're looking at the stock market or inflation, maybe not so good. So we're kind of in a, I don't know, transitional period, I would say. Good time to start a business. Absolutely. I, I believe that 100%. I also believe in diversity. Right. you got to be able to, to feed everybody because if you feed one guy, that one guy is going to get full. And then what do you got? So you got to be able to feed everybody. That's why I chose AT Lending because I have something for everybody. Now, you've been in the business, like you said, for a long time, we, and you have seen where economies uh, go up and they come down. And wherever we are in this particular cycle, uh, loans that are coming in the door, are you seeing mostly purchase? Are you seeing mostly non-QM? What is it that you're reading in the market? I'm still seeing a lot of everything. Okay. I'm seeing a lot of DSCR loans coming in because people don't want to show their income. Yep. I'm seeing a lot of W-2 only loans coming in because... Again, people don't want to show their income. They're maybe being garnished. They don't want to show that. They have, uh, uh, you know, uh, liabilities coming out of check. They don't want to show that. I got a program for that. We're still doing FHA loans because that is always the market. Everybody yep. wants to live in California. I don't care who you are, where you come from. You want to be here, the sunshine state where it's always beautiful. The weather's great. Our prices are always great. It's a great place to be. We are always going to be busy. Okay. Where do you see it heading in terms of rates? Do you see it settling I, or, or I, moving higher? No. No, I, th I think they're going to be moving. I, th I think we're, we all got a feeling they're going to be moving for some time. Yep. Maybe we'll get a break sometime next year. Yep. But I think this year we're going to see a steady incline. Yeah, okay. So, um in the purchase market, when we're looking at uh, uh, housing here, let's say we're talking just strictly about, oh, that's another quick question. Uh, how many states do you lend in? We're everywhere. You have 50 states? Yes, sir. Okay, so you're, you're lending everywhere. Do you see housing inventory rising here or other places or even in the micro markets in Southern California? Like maybe Riverside, they're going up a little bit, but maybe not so much in Orange County? You know what? I'm, I'm seeing it across the board. I mean, I'm doing loans in Bakersfield. Okay. I mean, Bakersfield is exploding. There's little, uh, I forget the name of the city outside of Bakersfield. It used to be dirt. Now it's booming. City. It's happening everywhere. Moreno Valley, Riverside, San Bernardino. It's just happening everywhere in California. People who can't afford maybe a million-dollar house in West L.A., they're buying in Bakersfield. They're buying a $143,000 house 
and they're telecommuting because they don't have to drive all that way right. anymore. I think it's a great time to buy. It's always a great time to buy. You know, I, in terms of, you know, having security for your future and obviously seeing equity build, I mean, traditionally we see about 4 and a quarter percent over the long run, over 30 years. But over the last two years, we've seen 20 percent. Now, that usually means that we're going to have a downtime where somebody's going to lose some equity in their home. They're talking about whether it's a housing boom or a housing bust or a bubble. Um, what do you see? You know, I, we, we've been through the whole gamut where – People have bought a house for uh, for five hundred thousand, then the the market crashed, went down to maybe three hundred thousand. Now that house is back up to a million. I wouldn't even try and predict what's going to happen. Right. All I know is that uh, real estate is always going to be something you hold on to. Right. God is not making any more land, <laughs> so you got to get what you can. No, that is I totally agree with that. Well, you sound very excited about your. Uh, the job and the company that you work for, it's its really nice to hear because I hear so many people, now maybe it's because you're, you know, not getting on in age, but you know, no spring chicken either. Usually it's, it's younger people that are complaining about either not making enough or they can't afford to pay their student loans or, you know, but you, nope, that's good. And I think that's what you need, especially in a, in a changing marketplace, whether you're you're doing loans or whether you're selling cars or whatever you're doing, you need that kind of attitude. I appreciate that attitude that you bring to the show, especially when you're talking about a new, uh, exciting venture that you're doing. Absolutely. I, I think you got to be positive because yep. there's way too much negativity. We don't need it. We just got to keep keep on, keep our eye on the ball and keep moving forward. No, I totally agree. Let people know how to get in touch with you, especially since they want to be able to learn more about what you're doing there and talk to you, too. Absolutely. You can always contact me through Malibu Funding with Jeff. Always, he can always get me any time of the day, or you can call me at 323-228-5181. And my email address is bigbadloandaddy at gmail.com. Love that. I mean, I that's one I have never forgotten. From the first time I ever heard it. <laughs> Big Bad Loan Daddy, thank you very much for coming on the show. Uh, we'll do it again soon. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's Thomas Trujillo from AT Lending. I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. We'll be right back. You're listening to The Mortgage Voice with Jeff Barton. We'll be right back with more in just a moment. For more information on today's topic, email Jeff Barton at info at malibufunding.net. Now, back to The Mortgage Voice with your host, Jeff Barton. Welcome back and hello to everybody. Once again, this is Jeff Barton. I'm your voice in the mortgage industry. Listen, we're on a bunch of different podcasts, whether it's Apple or Google or Spreaker or Stitcher or um, Podclips.io, any number of these terrific places where you can listen to the show. Uh, plus, we have the, the radio stations, of course, and we're on YouTube as well, Jeff Barton, The Mortgage Voice. All of these, you can sign up, be a member. We had a bunch of sign-ups last month. Really appreciate that. Because of the volatility and what's happening in the mortgage, you've got to be on top of this stuff. If you want to be on top of this and know the mortgage information right away, exactly when it happens, you got to tune in to what we're trying to do. We're also on LinkedIn and Facebook and Instagram. Uh, I did a a, a short segment today just about the volatility and by the way it was very confusing even to me and i'm in the business why do things do what they do when they do it and how do you plan for the future if even the prognosticators i.e everybody on cnbc bloomberg um any of the business channels that you see or hear out there either on radio or television they're guessing let me tell you something i have i spent the last two weeks reading and looking at everything I could about what's happening with inflation, what's happening with the economy, what's happening with mortgage rates, what's happening with the Fed raising the short-term interest rates to member banks by 50 basis points or a half a point. And quite frankly, there are two schools of thought. The world is ending is the first world rule of, uh, <laughs> school of thought. And the second one is it's almost ending. So there is nobody out there who's predicting a, what they call a soft landing. All these terms are just ridiculous. If you're working right now, that's a good thing. But you could have a better job. This is one of the silver linings or the, or the great things about what's happening right now. There are two job openings for every person who's unemployed. Let me say that again. There are two job openings for every person who's unemployed, which means there's a better job for you out there. And if you're 
uh, watching that Indeed commercial on television, they're basically saying quit your job and go find a better one, which is a problem. We had four and a half million people last month quit the job they were in. And so when employers are trying to figure out how they're going to not only fill the job openings they have, but keep the people they already have employed, that's why there's such pressure on wages and such pressure on inflation. The, to me, listening to the pundits, listening to people talk about the economy and about what's happening with mortgage interest rates and it's all doom and gloom, I look to the employment, who's working and what are they making, and I look to can they afford the mortgage payment. Now, when you're getting approved for a mortgage, they don't take into account your monthly expenses beyond your mortgage payment. They'll look at credit cards, sure, but they're not going to look at your food. They don't know that gas costs another, you know, 8% this month or whatever it was that it went up from last year, 8.5% inflation. They don't realize that because they're just looking at can you afford this mortgage based on what you make. So that's a good thing. That means that inflation really isn't hurting the dollar amount. What's hurting your dollar amount in terms of what you can afford to borrow is the interest rates. Now, the interest rates, as I said, are at 5.5%, let's say, and are about ready to go up again, and we have to continue to watch that. So if you're in the should I lock or should I float, which means should I not lock, uh, I always recommend locking in these kinds of environments. Even if it's a 45-day lock, it may cost you a little bit more in terms of upfront costs, but it's better to be safe. Now, there is uh, – let me just get to it here for a second. Okay. So if we're looking at certain types of loans, non-QM, let's talk about a non-QM loan. And we talked about that a little bit earlier in, a, in the show segment that we talked about, okay, so you're a business person, you are – putting good deposits into your business bank account, but you do a lot of write-offs on your business, like your car, your maybe some of the rent in your home, maybe some of the expenses. So you're not showing a huge salary or a huge profit at the end of the year, but you're you know writing off a lot of stuff. You can use those bank statements for your business, the deposits, to qualify for the mortgage. Now, it's going to cost you 7%, but these are called non-QM loans. So the problem with the non-QM sector in the last 45 days has been that you will lock a rate at a certain rate. And at the end of your lock time, let's say you do a 45-day lock on a non-QM loan at 6%. At the end of 45 days when you're about ready to close, the loan, the, the rate on your loan is now 7%. Now you've locked it at 6%. Now what incentive does the lender have to actually close that loan? Zero. They're losing money on the loan. So in this type of volatile market, you want to be able to make sure you come to the loan officer, whoever's doing your loan, with everything up front. You want to close that loan as quickly as possible. Now, non-QM is a faster way to go. Now, in, in some of the conventional sense, in some of the bigger companies who have a lot of automated stuff, you can close in 14 days. That's ideal in this world especially with the non-QM, because you don't want to have the coupon or the, the amount of money that they're going to have to pay somebody to buy that loan to be more than what you locked your rate in. <laughs> that, that would be a huge problem for anybody. But these lenders who have millions and millions of dollars loaned out at rates that right now they can't sell have zero incentive. So closing quicker is the best way to go. And that's <laughs> that to me is about as important as anything else. Now, when I look at what's happening in, 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 the, uh, in the stock market, so people who are older, people my age, 50, 60 years old, they're now looking at their house as their major asset because the house values keep going up. Now, your stock market portfolio, your funds, whatever you're invested in for your retirement, whether it's your work or whether it's you personally or however you are invested in the market, it's not great right now, down 14 15% already this year, may go down even more. But your house is going up 13 14% this year. They actually say it's probably going to go about 5%, but it has in the last two years gone up about 34%. That's a big number. So how do you take advantage of the equity in your home without losing the 3% interest rate? It's interesting. And we're going to call, and if you call, call me, call somebody else, ask them, what's best? Is it a HELOC? That's a home equity line of credit. Or is it a, a, a second mortgage if you need to take money out? 
Now, a lot of people say, hey, you know what? You leave the money in your house. It's the best hedge against inflation, especially since home prices are rising. Oh, there she is. I don't know who that is, but somebody's calling me. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so we talked some about where housing is plentiful, where it isn't plentiful. Uh, most of what's happening in the U.S., the, the housing is not plentiful. But in several areas, they are. And I drew up a list here just to give you an idea. Down in Albuquerque, for instance, last year at this time, there were 1,059 houses available. This year, only 741. So Albuquerque is not a great market right now in terms of houses on the market. So that's why their prices are now 100,000 more than they were uh, two years ago. Uh, at 250, you could have bought a house then and done and had a pretty nice house. But now it's it's about 350. Um, let's see. Let's look at the Atlantic market. Now, housing housing units are up uh, about 800 units uh, in that time frame. One year, 21 to 22. Jacksonville, Florida, down big time, over a thousand. Now, these numbers of what available in April, 3,000 houses in Jacksonville. Jacksonville is a big city. 3,000 houses sounds nothing, but it was over 4,000 last year at this time. Okay, let's look at Portland, Oregon. About the same. About 2,220 houses available now. Same thing last year. Santa Clara, California, there's about a couple hundred houses less. So in these examples, Denver, about 1,000 more. Las Vegas, about 600 more. Las Vegas is a good market, by the way. You can still get out there and get into a house under three, four hundred thousand dollars if you look around long enough. And uh, if if the market's coming back to whereby there's more housing on the market than there was, that's a good sign for everybody. Now, if you think it's bad here, okay, China. I'm just going to run down some things. We talk about China. Why? Because um, if their economy is booming, it makes gasoline go prices go up. Now you're saying how much higher can it go? <laughs> I know. I think the average price in the U.S. is about 420. Anyway, China. New home sales fell 33% in 23 major cities. Not good. Stocks have dropped. Stimulus fails to ignite housing. The grave job situation and amid, uh, okay, uh, lockdowns. Now, has everybody heard the two major cities um, in China have locked down for COVID? I don't even think they have a lot of a lot of COVID cases. They just see one, two, they lock down the whole city. Not a good thing, but a good thing in terms of demand on oil. Um, the slower loan growth, yeah, that's obvious. If we have that many fewer people buying new homes, uh, the loan growth is also going to do. Now, the government, they did their stimulus, but it hasn't really helped. Listen, there's so much information I need to get to. Uh, tune in, by the way, LinkedIn or Facebook. Uh, just look me up, Jeff Barton or The Mortgage Voice, and you can see and hear all the information you need on a daily basis. I'm Jeff Barton. Thanks very much for tuning in. We'll see you next time. You're listening to The Mortgage Voice with Jeff Barton. For more on today's topic, visit www.malibufunding.net. Thank you, Riverside County, for listening to KCAA 102.3 FM, the